Thank you all for staying for the second portion of our forum this evening. Um, again, my name's Ingrid Flory. I'm here from, I'm the moderator for the evening from the League of Women Voters, Northampton area. Uh, we are joined by our, our same panelists. We have Jean Chordak from the League of Women Voters. We have Stan Moulton, the opinion editor from the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and Natalia Munoz, who's uh, a host of Via con Munoz. Vaya con Munoz. Vaya con Munoz <laughs> from WHMP. And to my left, we have our two candidates um, who are both running for city clerk here in Northampton, Robert Driscoll and Pamela Powers. So I'd like, let's, let's welcome our candidates. So this forum is going to follow very much the same, um, the same format as our previous one, except we have allowed time, uh, three minute opening statements. Um, before we started, we, uh, the candidates drew straws, and uh, Bob is going to be giving the first, first uh, opening statement, and then Pam will have her opportunity. So, so, and then we will be rotating through questions, as we did in the previous <coughs> portion of our forum. So. Well, welcome. Why don't you uh, share with us your opening statements? Good evening. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in tonight's forum. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters and the media partners for their sponsorship of this event. Over the past several weeks, I've been going around the city, going door to door, meeting residents and voters. On several occasions, I've been asked the question, what does a city clerk do? The position of city clerk has several important duties. The city clerk is the chief election office official who oversees elections and voter registration, collects, processes, and issues copies of vital records, is a custodian of the municipal archives, oversees the, city, oversees the annual citywide census, issues business licenses, dog licenses, and other various licenses, and is a central records access officer. Many people may not have the need or opportunity to interact with the city clerk's office very often. I was very fortunate to be exposed to his office at a young age, because my mother worked in the city clerk's office for many years. As a child, I would visit her at work and begin to learn about the work of the department. I became very interested in the historical records held by this office, especially the vast amount of vital records. History has always been an interest of mine. After graduating from Northampton High School, I earned a bachelor's degree in history from Westfield State College. Later, a master's degree in education with a concentration in history, also from Westfield State College. For the past 20 years, I have been teaching history and government at the middle school level. During this time, I have had the opportunity to work with the city clerk on many occasions. For the past 15 years, I have served as an election officer in Precinct 2A. I am very familiar with the election process. I understand the issues and questions that can arise on election day. I am confident that I can serve as the Chief Election Officer for the City. I have also had many opportunities to work with the vital records and archives. For, for many years, I have worked on genealogical research. I have spent significant amounts of time in the City Clerk's Office using the records. I understand the importance of these records and need to preserve them for the future generations. I will take steps to ensure that these records remain protected and available. Through this process, I have also become aware of the sensitive nature of some vital records and the need to protect these records. The city clerk's office has always been a well-run office. I have been fortunate to work with former city clerks, Wendy Mazza and Christine Skrupski, and observe how the office is run. I look forward to the opportunity to build on the great legacy these clerks have left behind and they move the office forward with new ideas. I have the background, knowledge, and leadership skills needed to serve as your next city clerk. Thank you. Thank you. Pamela. My print's a little bit bigger. I think I'm slightly older than Bob. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Pamela Powers, and I'm here as a candidate for the position of city clerk for Northampton. I'm married to Christopher, and together we are the proud parents of three teenage children, all raised here in Florence. As a family, we are deeply committed to Northampton. On July 13, I was elected by the City Council as the interim clerk to fulfill the unexpired term of retiring City Clerk Wendy Mazza. 
In reaching its decision, the City Council considered that I have a master's degree in business administration that's directly applicable to the management of a high-functioning, fast-paced administrative office. I have a proven track record for delivering exceptional customer service in an office setting. I have six years of hands-on municipal government experience and am well-versed in the legislative process, record-keeping, census-taking, elections, and every single computer program used by the city clerk's office. I'm an experienced manager and leader of complex operations with fiscal, record-keeping, and personnel responsibility. Long gone are the days when you can look at a paper log and follow what the person did before you. Today, there are nearly a dozen computer programs tailor-made for the city clerk's office. This is a roll up your sleeves, hit the ground running operation every day. I prepared a handout that describes what the effective clerk will do, will be able to do on January 2nd, 2018. In broad terms, the city clerk collects records, counts, files, indexes, posts, preserves, and transmits information in accordance with state statute, local ordinance, and office policy. The office speaks a foreign language, not on purpose, but that's the nature of any industry, a common nomenclature understood by that agency and transferable to others in the same setting. The experienced clerk knows Laserfiche, FoxPro, VIP, Civic Plus, E-Code, VRIS, GEO, MUNIS, Municity. Ever heard of FOIA? The clerk is the records access officer for that new law. Heard about LUCA? The clerk has. Tonight, I hope to answer your questions about, my, about how my experience, education, and commitment to Northampton will best serve our community. I want to thank the Daily Hampshire Gazette, the League of Women Voters, and WHNP for this event and for their commitment to keeping the public informed and engaged in the democratic process. Thank you. We will now begin asking questions from our, our panelists. Again, audience, I encourage you to write down questions as they occur to you and raise them up so our volunteers know to come and collect them from you. Um, Similar to last time, the uh, questions are limited to 30 seconds in length and must be asked to both candidates, and candidates will have 90 seconds to answer the questions. Rebuttals will be allowed if a candidate singles out or criticizes the other candidate by name or implication, and the offended candidate may ask for 30 seconds to respond. One rebuttal time will be allowed per candidate. We will be rotating through our panelists in the same way as before with the legal women voters asking questions on behalf of audience members. Then to, we'll receive a question from WHMP, back to the legal women voters, and the D Daily Hampshire Gazette. This way that we'll have an equal number of questions from the audience as from um, our media panelists. So Jean, why don't you ask a question of the panelists, uh, sorry, from the audience, and, um, and Pam, you'll be the first to answer mm -hmm. this question. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna start right off with this one. In your opinion, should the city clerk be an appointed or elected position? Uh, throughout my entire campaign, I think that's the uh, most um, asked question. Um, I think that the needs of the citizens come before um, anything serving anybody else in um, the entire um, community. Um, so I think really that uh, the voters need to make that decision. I know that the former clerk indicated that she thought that the election, that the, the positions should be um, elected. Um, and I, I have done a little bit of research about that and found that there are good reasons to keep it elected, to keep it sort of autonomous and, and uh, making sure that it serves only the public. Um, however, there's a lot, of, um, a, a lot of thought about the fact that much of what the clerk does is uh, driven by state law and local ordinances. So um, there, there possibly is you know, a good argument for that as well. But really, it should be left up to the voters. 
I think it should be an elected position. It's been an elected position, and I think it should remain an elected position. Um, when we revised our city charter a few years ago, this issue was discussed. Uh, we reviewed the issue, the charter commission reviewed the issue, and elected to keep it as an elected position. Um, other positions, the city treasurer, were moved to be an appointed position. The city clerk remained an elected position. And I think that commission reviewed all the reasons for it and decided to keep it elected. I think the city clerk should be in an elected position uh, and checking with people who work for the Secretary of State's office. The Secretary of State's office feels the elected clerks are better than appointed clerks. They feel that an appointed clerk, there's too much potential of a conflict. Not to say there's going to be a conflict, not to say there's going to be an issue, but there's potential there. If you're appointed by the mayor, if you're appointed by the city council, you'd be overseeing the elections of your appointing officer. There's a possibility that you, a clerk, could be influenced in some way by the mayor, by the city council. By keeping it elected, you serve the people and nobody else. The clerk only answers to the citizens of the city, not to the mayor, not to the city council. I think that's the way it should remain. Thank you. Next question will come from Natalia, and Bob, you will answer it first. Um, Disagreements over LGBT uh, civil rights have led certain city clerks across the country to, for instance, not issue marriage licenses, um, even though the law says that they should. How do you see your role as a city clerk then? These issues will come up again. It may not be LGBT, it'll be something, out, something else next time. But who do you answer to, your personal beliefs, the current political wins? How will you address that issue? I think as city clerk, you have to answer to the peop the citizens you serve. And I think, and I would answer, my role is to answer the citizens. It wouldn't be my personal opinions. I would not let my, let my views influence my decision. Whoever wants to marry, I think, should have the right to marry. I, if the state makes it a law to let people marry, that's the law I would follow. I would follow whatever law is put in place. I would not let my personal views affect who was going to get married. I think when we changed the law to allow uh, um, the marriage laws that we have today, I fully support them. I know uh, the city clerk, when that happened, uh, city clerk Mazza had a little bit of an issue with this, people having an issue with issuing the marriage license. I think she did the right choice and I would do the same thing. I think we answered to the, to the citizens and whatever the right thing for the citizens, if people want to marry, I fully support that. And I would allow anyone to marry that is, meets the requirements to marry. I would not let my personal opinions get in the way of that. Well, I, I think, and not just in the case of marriages, I think that uh, the opinion of the clerk uh, plays no role in the, uh, in, the, in the decision to perform or not to perform. Um, I think um, it's really a function of what the state requires, um, what the law is, and um, the the opinion of the clerk should not matter. So I, you know, I um, would act in that way. Thank you. Another question from the audience, please, Jean. And this will <coughs> go to Pam first. What will you do to reach out to minority communities and register them to vote? Well, um, th there's plenty of opportunity. I think um, over 700,000, I think it's been determined that over 700,000 people in Massachusetts who are eligible to register to vote are not registered. Um, and so that's an important um, role of the clerk to try to reach out to people. Um, I, I think it, it would be, uh, be um, an important step to reach out to the um, Casa Latina or other organizations to, you know, to make sure that, that people know how to register to vote and to make sure that they understand, you know, how important it is in our democratic process that they participate. So I, I, I think education is the key to that. I, I agree. I think we need to educate people. I think registering to vote is a very important thing for everybody. Minority groups, everyone should be registered to vote. I think we need to do more outreach to, to get that word out there, to publicize as much as we can, to put 
you know, announcements in the newspapers, to put announcements on Facebook, to put announcements wherever we could to reach out to people, to remind them to register to vote. I think also outreach through the schools, trying to go to the schools, trying to hold events to register people to vote in the schools, and trying to use the community, the community um, events, the community groups, reach out to the community groups, to go to the groups and ask them for their assistance in registering people to vote. Use the community as best we can. Go to the organizations and try to, who serve various uh, populations of our community and ask them to help us to register people to vote, to get the word out there. Because it's very important to register to vote, and many people don't take advantage of that. So we need to do our best. And I, as much as we try, people are still not going to register to vote. But we just have to do as, as much as we can to get the word out there, to tell them when the dates are to register to vote, and try our best to get them to register to vote. Thank you. A question from Stan, and this will go to you first, Bob. Uh, what do you consider to be your, uh, your top leadership skills that will make you an effective manager, not only of the, of the office itself, but also in informing the public, reaching out to the public to make it clearer about things like the importance of registering to vote? Well, I think I've been a teacher for 20 years. I've been serving in a role as a educating people my, in the last 20 years. I know how to reach out to people. I've been working with parents, with students. Uh, I've been working with other teachers. I've served in a capacity to oversee teachers on leadership teams. Uh, I think I have the ability to reach out to people and to manage a group, of, to manage, and I think I know how to reach out um, and to get a message across, to, uh, to, to tell people uh, what needs to be explained. And I can reach out to various groups, use my skills as a former teacher to educate people about the work of the city clerk's office, to educate them about the need to register to vote, the need of, to educate them about the election process, to educate them about various things that the city clerk does. I would say um, the the number one thing to sort of as a leader um, to that would help sort of a, achieve the goal would be um, to be an effective communicator. Um, but in order to get the job done as a as a leader, uh, you have to really be a motivator of people, and I think that's one of the greatest strengths that I have. Um, is to be able to work with people um, to reach agreement, perhaps, on, you know, something that needs to get done. Um, I think, you know, part of, uh, part of the job is to sort of make it attractive. Even the most mundane jobs uh, need to, you know, people ha need to have a, f a feeling of being uh, of making accomplishments and that sort of thing. And so I think that my ability to motivate people uh, is, pro is probably key. Okay. Thank you. Another question from the audience, please, and this will go to Pam first. Okay. Um, this has a couple of questions in, inside it. Uh, we know the clerk maintains records of births, deaths, and <coughs> marriages. What other records, if any, does the clerk keep? Are all the clerk's records open to the public? Who has access to these? How does the public get access? What improvements or changes to records, record access procedures would you introduce? That's a lot of questions. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, <Get> all that? <laughs> I think uh, uh, the, the city clerk's office is the depository for just about every record that's kept um, for uh, um, birth, marriage, and death, as you've mentioned, um, business certificates. Um, there's, there's also dog license records that we keep. There's voter records. There's uh, registration records. Um, there's just a ton of records. Um, as far as giving people access to the records, I think we can do more. There are some ideas that I have about making business um, certificates available to people uh, via the internet. I think it would help uh, from a com consumer advocacy, advocacy standpoint, and it would also uh, help promote some of the newer businesses in the area. Um, I, uh, uh, I think also that we um, 
as far as how people access those records, they can come into the office, they can, they can send an email. Uh, we, in one of the most interesting uh, requests that I had as the records access officer for the city, uh, we, we keep records of people who ask for records and somebody asked me <laughs> so, somebody asked me for a copy of the records that we keep of people asking for records so that was kind of interesting <laughs> All right. well yeah the city clerk keeps a lot of records birth, death, marriages, uh, business licenses, dog licenses who voted, um, how many people voted in the last election uh, all that is contained in the city clerk's office as far as who should access them, I think a lot of the records are public records. Birth, death, marriages are all public records. Um, who voted in the last election is public record. Uh, people can go into the office and access those records. I think as far as making them more available, it would be great if we could make more records available online. I think obviously the issue there is funding. How do you come up with the money to get all those things online? Uh, you know. I, Birth, death, and marriages are public record. You're not going to put all those online. There's no way you can put 300 years of history of, of records online. I think there's ways that we need to work on preserving those records, having uh, those records, um, make sure they're they're there for the long term. It, but people can come in the office and review the records, look at the records, um, send the email to get the records. So I think there's ways if, if people want the records, they can access them in the city clerk's office because they are a public record. I think it would be great if we get more of them online, but I think the issue would be having the, the manpower to get them online and the money to get them online. Am I able to? Um, only if you can have a rebuttal if if he if that's were okay. mentioned okay. specifically thank you and i did not hear that unless i missed it. nope you didn't okay all right um so natalia uh your question next and it'll go first to bob yes these are public records but as we know uh, there was attempts to interfere even with public records the voting rolls uh, so how do you balance that keeping those public records public, they have to be public, Correct. but also protect those public records so hackers can't get into them and start changing the information. Right. They are public records. You're not going to change that. Your know, state law dictates what's public record. Uh, we, the city clerk would follow state law. And I think when we put, if we put things on a website, we put them online, we'd have the trust in the state of Massachusetts that we, that state would have the firewalls and the protections uh, to protect against hackers being uh, getting access to them. It's always a concern when you put something online. It's always going to be an issue. And you have to balance the issue of what's the need of the public. They want to have access to these records and to keep them away from the hackers. You're right. And I think we just have to put the faith in the fact that the, the services we're using through the state would be protected and would have the um, mechanism in place not to get hacked. Um, and that's why I think there's, you have to balance what's going to be put online. You don't want to put you know, all the birth records and death records online because you don't want those out there. Uh, so I think you have to balance that and, and, have a, you know, and figure out what should be online so people don't get them. Thank you. Thank you. Pam? Well, uh, it's it's true that a majority of the records are open to the public as far as birth, marriage, and death, but there's a certain percentage of records that are not open to the public, um, and those records uh, should not be shared in any way, shape, or form, except with the individuals who are listed on that particular record, and the law is very clear on that. Um, as far as uh, access to information, um, you know, most of the records that we have are um, open to the public. We ask uh, as a means to protect, we ask for, for very specific details about what the person is looking for. Um, if, you know, we, we won't answer a request that says, give me the, you know, birth record for every um, person born this year. We will, you know, we will uh, answer a request for an open record if you give me the name, date of birth, and parents' information, um, 
so, so that it's you know it's only it, you know we sort of limit it in that way for the for the protection of the person on the record. Um, you know there are other things that that um, you know we we can't protect because it's you know by law it should be made available to the public. My goal is to make more of those records online to put them online and to make them easily access accessible to the public. Thank you. Do you have another question from our audience? And Pam, you'll answer um, it first. There seems to be a lot of unlicensed dogs in our neighborhoods. The clerk is responsible <laughs> for licensing. What is the system used to encourage compliance? What other licenses are issued? How does it work? Is that my question? To you first, yes. Okay. I think this is a problem that Clerk Mazza <laughs> knows a lot about. Um, we tried to tackle the unlicensed dogs um, when I was her assistant in, in the city clerk's office. Uh, but essentially, we're not the policing agent for dog licenses. We're the ones who issue the license. We ensure that, that the pet has rabies. Uh, rabies uh, uh, <laughs> vaccination. Sorry, uh, we don't want dogs with rabies. Um, and and you know we sort of uh, y you know do our duty from that standpoint. We've provided the records to the people who are responsible for in you know enforcing the laws. Um, we've provided the information, and you know it's it's a. I think it's just a question of manpower. Um, you know, if there's a lot of unlicensed dogs out there, we can send letters. We can, and we have. We've we've sent letters. We've tell, told people um, you need to, you know, license your dog. We've explained what the state law is, but really, you know, I think it's just a question of manpower in terms of being able to enforce it fully. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I agree. I think. You know, the city clerk can only do so much. The city clerk is in charge of issuing dog licenses, yes, but I don't think the city clerk's office can possibly try to you know, register unlicensed dogs. Uh, the city clerk's office is not going to go through neighborhoods trying to find dogs that are, don't have a dog tag and register them. I think that enforcement would have to fall you know, more to the dog officer and, and things like, of that nature. I think, yes, we can. You know, the city clerk's office can certainly send letters, uh, reminders, to uh, dog owners that it's time of the year to register the dogs uh, and try to encourage them of what the importance of registering a dog would be, uh, why it's important to have your dog licensed, uh, to have the dog tags. But I, I mean, I don't think it's uh, the city clerk doesn't have the manpower or the means to uh, track down people that have not registered their dogs. There's so much work in the city clerk's office to be done that there's not enough time to focus on the unlicensed dogs in the city. Uh, our next question will come from Stan Moulton from the Gazette, and Bob, you'll answer it first. Uh, I want to return to the question about online access of records, not historic records, not the old paper records and trying to get those online, but going forward, this is the 21st century. What, what have, ideas do you have from looking at the city clerk's office here or elsewhere about, about getting more current and future records online to make them more accessible? Well, I think as far as vital records, I don't think you can really, you don't want the vital records online easily accessible. There's too much, there's too much issues. You don't want a birth record online. People, there's identity theft and so forth. Even death records and marriage records, you don't want the current records online. Uh, death records, even though they're open records, people can go in the office and look them up. There's things that you just don't want to, make that easily accessible on a record. You don't want people to be, have that access. I think as far as other records the city clerk holds, such as you know business licenses, I think yes, we should look into how we can get those records online and how we can make more of those records accessible. I think we should look at you know the city websites and see if we could find a way to put more of those online or put more about the uh, zoning application that the city clerk holds and the permit application the city clerk office holds. Put more of those things online. I think we should look into that and see if there's ways to do that. But vital records, no, I don't think vital records should be online. Uh, and, and I don't think even who voted in last elections should be online. That's something that if someone wants to research and find out, they should have to go in the city clerk's office to find. But business licenses and such, yes, I think they should be put placed, uh, try to be placed online if possible. Thank you. Okay, 
I just wonder if Stan could just repeat the question. The, the question is about uh, ideas that you have, either through your experience in the city clerk's office here or looking at other clerk's uh, offices, uh, about getting more records going forward online. So uh, I have done some benchmarking on this particular issue. Um, the city of Worcester has a great file cabinet uh, of public records on the city clerk's website. Uh, they keep uh, a treasure trove of information on there. It seems like every document the city clerk gets, she puts into this electronic file cabinet and uh, makes it immediately accessible to the, um, to the public. Uh, I think our planning department also has a similar uh, tool that they use. Uh, the, the actual software is called Laserfish. Um, and they, they have a, a file cabinet, although theirs is a little bit more complicated in terms of set, the way it's set up. But that's a tool that's available to us. I think we should use it. Um, and I also know that the planning department, I think Bob had mentioned uh, zoning and uh, uh, um, uh, zoning uh, plan, zoning, uh, uh, applications were should be made available to the public and they already are they're on the planning website so it's it's we should use that tool in the city clerk's office okay. thank you do you need another question okay. from the audience and this will go to Pam first retired city clerk Wendy Maza was quoted as saying the hardest part of the job is running elections what would you do to make it a smooth process? That's a loaded <laughs> question. Uh, the, the election process for our community is a 300 person operation. It's sort of like, you know, herding cats, if you will, trying to get them all to, you know, march to uh, the same drum. Uh, I think training is key. I think people need uh, to be trained in the jobs that, that we're asking them to do, especially newly um, appointed people who are gonna be working the elections. I have training scheduled for November 3rd for the election workers, uh, which also includes the, the um, wardens who have uh, been participating in, in the election process. Um, I think uh, if, if people uh, feel comfortable in the job that they're doing, then, then the uh, process will go more smoothly. I think Wendy has it absolutely correct. It is a very difficult process. Elections are one of the most challenging parts of this job of city clerk. And it's a job that the running election lasts pretty much all year long. And years like last year when we had five elections that happened once a month, it really was even worse. Uh, working in the precincts, working as a ward clerk, uh, I see the problems, I see all the, pro the things that come up on election day, and there are so many problems that, 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 that need to be dealt with, issues that the city clerk needs to prepare with, getting the workers, making sure you have enough staff, making sure the machines are functioning properly, make, making sure everything's in place. So I think it is a, a challenge, and the best thing to do is try to start early and work you with the steps to make sure this, that everything is done. I think you know you have to, um, we have 14 precincts that need to be staffed. You need to start early to make sure you have the staffing needed to run those 14 precincts and to make sure you have people that know what they're doing in those precincts and to make sure you have everything in place, the ballots in place, and so forth. Uh, it's, it's a challenging job. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of work to it. But I think if you start early, get good people working on it, it does run. It, it will be as smooth as possible for a city this size. This will come to you first, Bob. Oh, okay. Este, it's just that um, Pam named something like seven software programs earlier. Um, Bob, maybe you know this. Is there a way of streamlining all those different computer programs, and and why there's have to, why does there have to be so so many different computer programs? And do any of them talk to the state or the federal government? Um, is there a budget to, to bring it all under one program? Or is this, is this truly an ignorant 
Question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think there's a way to get the seven programs all working together. I think the seven programs that Pam mentioned uh, all serve different purposes. They all do something different. So I don't think there's any way to get all seven programs functioning under one program. I think you have some programs that handle their re uh, uh, involving vital records, some programs involving dog licenses, uh, you have programs that involve city ordinances, so I, uh, state statutes, so no, I don't think they can work together. You can't get them all functioning together. You need all seven programs to do the job of the city clerk's office. So no, I don't think you can bundle them together. I think they're all a necessity of the job, that each one has a function, and yes, some of them do link to the state, some of them do communicate with the state um, for various tasks. So yeah, I think it's just one of those things that there are multiple programs to hold, to accomplish multiple tasks. There is such a variety of things that are done, are handled by the city clerk's office. And if you can imagine that there's the, you know, these these state uh, laws that dictate what needs to get done. In, the, in the, the state government, there's different branches of the government who are sort of creating these monsters, if you will, to, that they you know, sort of put upon the, the, the clerks to do their portion, you know, to serve their portion of the law that they're interested in. So then we have the software that, you know, that um, has been marketed to sort of help us do our job. So you know, I think there, there's no way that there could ever be a blend of one, um, one program that does it all. There's the state programs for births. There's the, um, the marketed program for dog licenses. There's the state program for uh, um, voter registration. And so it, it's really an, you know, a necessary evil of the job to have many uh, software programs. Okay, thank you. All right. Gene, a question from the audience, please. What are the most important qualities, qualifications, skills, and knowledge you would bring to the clerk's office? Well, I'm um, terribly organized, but when you come into the off office every day and see the desk that I'm using to, you know, to get the job done, you'd never know it. But I always start with a checklist. Um, I, I look at things from a higher perspective and try to uh, put my shoes at the very beginning of the process and you know, put my shoes on at the very beginning of the process, work my way through what needs to get done to sort of get things you know, uh, accomplished. Um, and so I, I think my, you know, my sort of um, I mentioned earlier that also an important element is to be able to motivate people. Um, one of the things that I really enjoy is working um, with the staff that's there. They're, um, they're a great group of ladies, all hired by Wendy, and um, they are all eager to, to um, help accomplish the, the, uh, the huge job of the clerk's office. Uh, one thing I think I think it brings the job would be my desire to do the job, my passion to do the job. This is something that I want to do. Uh, I'm look, I'm changing careers. I'm going to go from teaching to a job that's different from what I've done before. So I think I'd bring a fresh perspective. I think I'd bring a new passion to the job. I think I would. I'm not someone that's been around City Hall for a for a long time. I'm not someone that's been around City Hall at all. I would be an outsider. I would come to the job fresh new, uh, looking to start something different and bringing my new views and new ideas to the city. Uh, I also think I'm very organized. I'm you know, teaching for all the years. I have great people skills. I can relate to people. I can relate to people in a variety of backgrounds and uh, deal with anything that might come along. But I think also, you know, teaching for 20 years, I'm very organized, planning, uh, taking step by step and getting things organized. But I think just just my desire to do this job would be the best asset I could bring to the job. Thank you. And a question from Stan. This will go to Bob first. I think we learned from the answer to Natalia's last question that we can't streamline the computer programs. But what about the people? 
Uh, do you have any ideas about efficiencies in the office, uh, perhaps working more closely with other city employees, cross-training with the uh, Registrar of Voters, for example? I think cross-training is okay in certain areas. I think cross-training overall it, for the city clerk's office does not always work. I think the city clerk's office, with the staff they have right now is understaffed. The, to do the job, the city clerk's office <coughs> requires more people. I can remember the office having five people just in the city clerk's office alone, not including the registered voters office. So I think having a city clerk's office of a clerk and an assistant is far understaffed. I think the registered voters office, yes, you can utilize that and cross-train for some tasks. If someone comes in and wants a dog license, yes, you can cross-train that. But I don't think you can cross-train on everything because there are records, birth records, for instance, that are confidential. You don't want to have everyone have access to those records. I think they need to be specifically the clerk's office staff that looks at those records and accesses those records. So I think you can streamline some things and cross-train through, through the registered voters' office, but I think there's a lot of things that it, even the election process, a lot of tasks for the election office, elections are the city clerk's responsibility. And I think with a staff of two people, it's an understaffed office. And I think that's something that down the road needs to be looked at. The city clerk is really, you know, is, is a leadership position. And as a leader, you need to identify those tasks that can be done by everybody and those tasks that, you know, sort of should be the responsibility, the sole responsibility of the city clerk. Um, Cross-training is, it, it, you, you would not survive in the city clerk's office without doing some cross training. Um, there are multiple tasks that are that are the responsibility of the clerk's office that can be done by the entire staff. Uh, there are more of those than there are of those that should be left just to the clerk. I think the key is getting people trained and getting people to understand you know, what that, that specific job that they're doing and how it uh, impacts the, the service that they're trying to provide to the customer. Thank you. Jean, do you have another question from our audience? Yep. <clears throat> uh, does the clerk play any role in registering voters or is this strictly up to the registrar of voters? Are there any changes in voting registration you would introduce in voting yeah that's me right this goes to you first uh, well the clerk serves on the board of registrars uh, so the answer to that is yes the clerk does play a role in registering people um, as I'm sorry the second half of your question had to do with are there any changes in voting registration you would introduce I, I don't think that that's something that the city clerk can do. That's, no, I don't think that's so either. driven by state statute. So, yeah. right. After I asked that, I realized that's That's all right. This is an opportunity for us to all learn about <laughs> what is encompassed in these positions. So. Yeah, I, I don't think I need to respond. Yes, this voter registration is handled by the state, so you, you can't the city clerk could not change it. Um, I think the process we have now works well. I know there's a lawsuit about changing the time, but that would be up to the state to change. So if the state changes, the city clerk would have to adopt to it. Okay. Thank you. Natalia, do you have a question to start with, Bob? Uh, yes. Um, what are some of the challenges that the city clerk's office has in terms of its budget? You mentioned earlier that there are not enough people who work there. Uh, what other challenges are there that should be addressed, and how would you address them? Well, I think one thing we need to address going forward, a, a big item for the city clerk's office moving forward, is uh, voting machines. I think we need to really look into purchasing new voting machines. The voting machines we have that we're using now are over 20 years old. Uh, they go back to 1995 they were purchased. I think that's a big ticket item that we are going to need to look into. Uh, the machines, they're functioning, but there's, you know, every election there's small little issues that crop up with it. 
So I think moving forward, we need to investigate the purchase of new voting machines uh, that are more um, up to date. They're, they're newer models. Uh, the state has certified two models that are usable in the state. I think we need to investigate that. I would, you know, like to form if I were elected, I'd like to form a committee to review those models and see if how much they would cost, get bids on them, and see if we could purchase new voting machines. I think, you know, down the road as well, uh, electronic polling books for the polling places would be something to consider as well. That's long term, but, you know, I think voting machines would be a top priority uh, to something to look into because the election process is such a huge component of it. I think we need to uh, invest in new voting machines for the city. Natalia, could you repeat the question? What are some of the challenges that the city clerk's office has? It, earlier, I, there was a statement about there's not enough staffing. Um, and so what do, you, what do you identify as some of the challenges and how would you address them, whether it's budget, it's staffing, anything else? First of all, I'd like to say that the cost of new voting machines for the city would be $90,000 and I have submitted a capital improvement uh, project for that, um, for that, just that um, uh, project. Um, so the challenges that I would say that I see are to, you know, time is, time is money and I think one of the things one of the challenges that we have is that there are a lot of things we do because we've always done them. So the best way to sort of start reducing the amount of time it takes is to look at the process of what we're doing and figure out an easier, smarter, faster way to do it. Um, you, you know, a lot of this stuff, again, is state statute, but <laughs> Uh, a lot of the processes that we've adopted over time uh, haven't changed. So perhaps there's technology that we could be using or um, an easier way to do something. Um, you know, those are, those are the types of uh, things that I would look at for the challenges of, you know, the, the processes uh, being, uh, you know, a little complicated. So um, I believe we've run through the questions that the audience has presented at this point, and we have time for one more question of our candidates. So, yep. So I'm going to ask Dan to ask that last question, and um, and Pam, you will answer it first, followed by Bob. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to have to ask this as the closing question uh, a little differently for each of you. So for Pam, it's what's, what accomplishment that, you've, that you're responsible for in your years, six years working in the city clerk's office are you most proud of? And, and Bob, for you, it's as someone who's never worked formally in the city clerk's office, what are you, what's, what's, the, what's, what's the one quality that you have that you ask, would ask voters to consider that makes you more qualified than your opponent. So Pam, it's what, what's, what are you proudest of? What single accomplishment? Well, I think uh, there's been this talk about uh, open government and transparency. And the, the one thing that I have been able to do uh, in my six years is to create an interactive agenda that people can have access to information uh, that the uh, city councilors are voting on. So when you go to the city's website and you click on an agenda and you look at, uh, I'm referring to the city council's agendas, when you look at a city council agenda, there's a document associated with that. That's one of the things that, uh, one of the uh, tools that I have brought to, the, to um, an open government. And that's the one I'm the most proud of in my six years. I think the quality that I'd like people to consider most of me would be my, my commitment to the city. I'm born and raised in the city. Uh, I love the city. I think yeah, I'm making a, ch a choice to serve the city, to give back to the city. So I think my commitment um, to make a career change, to you know, look into the opportunity to serve the city in this role is something I want people to consider. Uh, I also think my uh, organizational skills, my people skills, my ability to work with people is something that I would like people to consider about me as well. Uh, the, the, my ability to um, 
interact with people of different backgrounds and to know people would be something I want people to consider about me. Okay. Thank you both. So this concludes our panelists' questions. Um, candidates now have two minutes to uh, provide their closing statements. And um, let's see. And so now, so we're going to start with Bob and then Pamela. Thank you again to the sponsor of tonight's forum. I appreciate the opportunity to answer your questions. In less than two weeks, you'll have the opportunity to cast your vote for city clerk. I'd appreciate your vote. The position of city clerk will be more than just another job for me. It'd be an opportunity to serve the city I'm proud to call home. Some people have asked me why I would give up my teaching career for a job in public service. I've long felt the call to serve in local government. This is the right time and opportunity for me to do that. The recent retirement of City Clerk Wendy Mazza presented this opportunity for me. I feel I am at the right age to make a career change and do something I feel, like, I feel called to do. This is not a sudden decision for me. I was born and raised in the city, and my family has a long history of service to our community. Both of my parents were city employees. The city clerk position would enable me to continue my family's legacy of commitment and service to the city. I have the knowledge, skills, and ability to serve as your city clerk. If elected to the position, I'll bring in the office new ideas to move the office forward. I look for ways to preserve the historical records contained in this office for future generations. I will ensure the elections are conducted as efficiently as possible. That everyone that, want, and that everyone that wants to vote has that opportunity. I'll bring in the office my commitment and integrity to make good decisions and to provide outstanding customer service to every individual that comes to the office. I look forward to building on the, past, on the great work that has been done by all the previous city clerks. Over the past few years, I've had the privilege of working closely with former city clerk Wendy Mazza. I'm, de I'm deeply honored to have the support and endorsements of the three previous city clerks, Wendy Mazza, Christine Skrupski, and Adeline Murray. These three past clerks know what it takes to be a great city clerk, and they are confident that I have the skills needed to do this job well. I ask you to join them in voting for me for city clerk. It would be an honor to follow in their footsteps. I'd be very grateful to have your support and your vote for city clerk on, November, on Tuesday, November 7th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ken? The city clerk serves everybody, every industry, every cause, political, religious, or civic affi affiliation have no bearing on, what this, on whether this office will serve you. Whether you are a HAMP or NOHO, Democrat or Republican, rich or low income, a business or individual, you will receive the same level of service from me. Experience is key to the service I can provide. Education is key to the service I can provide. Leadership is key to the service that the office can provide. The city clerk serves a pivotal role in providing the resources, training, and guidance necessary for the effective staff. It has become a highly technical position. Computers and softwares have replaced the paper and pencil. I'm ready to deploy the technology that will increase the level of services that this office can deliver. I'm ready to support voter rights I'm ready to be your next city clerk, and I ask for your support on November 7th with your vote. Thank you again for this opportunity to discuss this important role. Thank you. Thank you. I want to give one more thanks to our sponsors who helped to make this evening possible, to our panelists, and to the audience for your great questions. And a thanks to our candidates for their dedication to the city and public service. Thank you.